This lesson looks at Eastern Europe during the medieval period, especially Byzantium and Russia. And from this lecture, I want you to see how Eastern Europe developed a different culture from Western Europe, a difference in culture that helps explain why the Russians and the French are so different, even though they're both European peoples. First, let's look at the Byzantine Empire. And when we talk about the fall of Rome in the classical period, what we're really talking about is the fall of the Western Roman Empire headquartered at Rome and including places like modern-day France and Spain and Great Britain. But some scholars argue that the Roman Empire, that is the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, continued for another thousand years until 1453. So this is partially a problem of naming. How do we name an empire and do we consider the Byzantines to be the Roman Empire, and the Byzantines called themselves the Roman Empire, and the Muslims called the Byzantines Romani, or is the Byzantine Empire something different and separate, and Rome actually did fall in the 400s? Um, these are the kinds of things that historians love to argue about. But when we look at the Byzantine Empire, we see that it is in a very geographically interesting place. The Byzantine Empire sat at the meeting point of all the major trade routes of Afro-Eurasia. Right? Some geographers consider Africa and Europe and Asia to be one single continent. After all, you can walk from southern Africa all the way to eastern Russia without having to cross an ocean or a sea. And so why are those different continents? Right? It's kind of like, you know, other geographers argue that there really is only one continent in the Western Hemisphere, and we call that continent the Americas, whereas others say, no, 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 there are two continents here, North America and South America. Right? But the Byzantine Empire sits at the meeting point of all these major trade routes. And this makes it vulnerable on all sides to people who want to control it, right? The Romans controlled this area, and then after the Romans fell apart, the Europeans, like the Holy Roman Empire, wanted to control this area, as did the Muslims from the east. And so this has always been a, a very important position in the world, um, and people's strategy um, for controlling this area is very important. This also makes this region very multicultural, which has its advantages and disadvantages, as we've seen in class and, and, and as I've talked about before, especially with the Silk Roads, being a multicultural civilization has a lot of advantages because you get all kinds of different learning and different styles of doing things and different beliefs, uh, and people can share with each other Although sometimes being multicultural creates a lot of tension because, you know, sometimes people don't like people who are different from them. And so because of all this, the Byzantine Empire is at a very interesting place in the world. Now, the Byzantines became very powerful under Emperor Justinian. And Justinian rebuilt the city of Constantinople, which was this older Roman city that was founded under Emperor Constantine. Uh, and, and Justinian really set out to make his empire Rome again. He reconquered the old Roman territories in the Italian peninsula and North Africa and the Holy Land. And he organized their legal system. And he took control of the Christian church in his lands and built things like the Hagia Sophia, this large, famous Byzantine church, which we'll see later in this lecture. And under Justinian, um, the Byzantines stopped um, the expansion of the Persians who were invading from the east, and he converted parts of Syria and Mesopotamia, modern-day Syria and Iraq, to Christianity. Uh, later on, after Justinian's death, the Byzantines stopped the Arab Muslim adva ad advances in the 7th century. And so the Byzantines kind of served as a blockade of Europe 
from Muslim and later Turkish invasions. The Byzantines also spread their culture to the north into what is modern day Russia, the Ukraine, Georgia, Hungary, Romania, and even southern Poland. In 816, I'm sorry, in 864, the Byzantine monks Cyril and Methodius were sent north by the Byzantine government to convert the Balkans to Christianity. And they were somewhat successful, especially in southern Russia, what we now call Kievan Rus. Um, but they're probably their biggest contribution to the history of this area is that they developed a, a written alphabet, uh, the alphabet that we now call Cyrillic, uh, that is used by Russian and Ukrainian. And you see an example here of the Cyrillic alphabet. And you probably recognize some of the same letters that we use in English. There are also some letters here that come from Greek, and then some letters that are completely made up um, by Cyril and Methodius and have no relationship at all to any letters or sounds in English. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the southern part of Russia was known as Kievan Rus, and the capital of this area was Kiev, which is in the modern-day Ukraine. Um, and, and this area was controlled by the Slavic peoples, uh, and the Slavic peoples um, lived in what is now U the Ukraine, and they expanded northward and eastward from the so-called Pripyat marshes to control Russia. And like I said, their capital was at Kiev, and Kievan Rus was kind of a multicultural civilization itself. Uh, the Slavs mixed with the Scandinavian peoples. Now, as you'll know from the map study in this project, Scandinavia is uh, the peninsula in northern Europe that includes um, the, the modern countries of Norway and Sweden and Finland. Uh, Scandinavia also include the, included the smaller peninsula that is modern-day Denmark. Um, and so these Scandinavian um, or so-called Viking raiders and traders came down the Dnieper River from the Baltic Sea, also down the Volga River from the Baltic Sea, and mixed with the Slavic peoples. And so the modern-day Russians are kind of a mix of Slavs as well as Scandinavian peoples. Now, Kievan Rus also traded with the Byzantines to the south. Again, the Dnieper, and I don't really pronounce that word very well, but the Dnieper River was kind of a this super highway that connected um, northern Russia and Scandinavia with the Black Sea, which is in modern-day Turkey. Um, we actually get Vikings sailing all the way down into the Mediterranean along these rivers. And we also get Italian traders from places like Venice going all the way north into Russia. And so the Dnieper uh, is a very important um, geographic feature in this area. Now, under the leader Vladimir I, uh, Rus converted to Orthodox Christianity. And as we're going to see in this lecture, as well as our other studies in this project, Orthodox Christianity is very different from Catholic Christianity. And this explains a major cultural difference between what we now consider Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And Russia continued to imitate Byzantine culture. Um, and if we look at where Byzantium was, I mean, that's the area of modern day Greece and Turkey. Um, and so Russia, by imitating the Byzantine culture, language, and law, um, you know, Eastern European culture comes much more from the Greeks, whereas Western Roman, uh, Western European culture comes much more from the Romans. Uh, and Kievan Rus was very powerful all the way up until the mid 1200s, when the Mongols or the so-called Tatars. Um, conquered and controlled that area for about 200 years. And we're going to look at the Mongols in our next project. 
As I mentioned a moment ago, the split between Eastern and Western Christianity was a very important cultural moment in European history. And we call this cultural moment the Great Schism, right? A schism is a split or a division. Uh, and the Great Schism was this division in Christianity. The old Western Roman Empire, really after the fall of the Roman Empire, it was controlled by the Pope in Rome. And what we see in Western Europe is a powerful Pope controlling weak kings, these, you know, Celtic and Germanic kings throughout Western Europe, right? Modern day France and Germany and Switzerland and Spain and England, um, right? A powerful Pope controlling these weaker kings. The Byzantine Empire was kind of the opposite. Their emperor, you know, stretching back at least until Justinian, the empire, the emperor controlled the church, and so you have a very powerful political leader and very and you know weaker religious leaders, and so this set up um, a debate and a, a power struggle between the pope and the Byzantine Empire emperor, and the debates were primarily over rituals, right? What kind of bread would would be used in the communion service, whether or not paintings would be an important part of the religious worship. Um, there were also debates about whether or not priests could marry. And so while the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Roman Catholic Church were both Christian groups and held a lot of the same beliefs, these smaller debates, as well as I think the larger political power struggle, tore the two uh, parts of Christianity in half. And this led to the Great Schism uh, between, again, what we now call the Roman Catholic Church or the Western Church and Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Now, later in history, um, you know, again, this starts in the 700s once Islam and, and the Arabs become very powerful. They start invading um, the eastern parts of the Byzantine Emperor, Empire and the Byzantines were also weakened by the Crusades from about 1000 to 1200 CE. You have these Western European armies marching through Byzantium and tearing up cities and crop lands and generally causing problems. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Seljuk Turks um, invade from the east. And, and as you know from the map study, the Turkic lands are to the north of what is now modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan, clear over near western China. The Seljuk Turks uh, invade the eastern part of the empire and weaken it. And finally, Constantinople falls to the Ottoman Turks, this other Turkish tribe, in 1453. And that's the end of the Byzantine Empire. And um, all scholars agree that is the ultimate end of Roman power, or anything like a Roman Empire in the region. And the Ottoman Turks would control this area all the way up until the fall of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I in the early 1900s. So the Ottoman Empire was a very long-lasting empire. Um, however, even though the Byzantines fall, the Russians stay strong. And as I said, the Mongols ruled from the 1200s to the 1400s. And then afterwards, Russia becomes open to, you know, this long rise of power that it would experience even up until the present. I mean, Russia, even though the Soviet Union has fallen apart, Russia is still one of the richest, strongest nations on earth. And so Russia's best centuries would come later under Ivan the Third and Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Um, and, and so we want to keep an eye on Russia long term throughout upcoming projects because, as, as we know, the Russians are a very, very, very powerful element in, wor in the world. And so that's it. Thanks for watching. And again, think about you know the division between the Greek, Byzantine, Russian, Eastern Europe and the Roman, Catholic, Western Europe. And that helps explain a lot of the things that even go on in history today.